At the age of four years old, Don Bluth went off to the cinema and saw at that time the most ambitious movie yet, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the first of its kind in Hollywood. After that cinematic experience, Bluth would have an ambition to work for Disney, and it would gradually come to fruition. During his 20s, he would get a job there for a year, being an assistant animator on Sleeping Beauty. He would disband from Disney for a number of years, but eventually would work there during the summers, during his university days. By the early 1970s, he would be more permanently there, from a character animator on Robin Hood, to an animation director on Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2, The Rescuers, and Pete's Dragon. But over the years working for Disney, he couldn't help but notice a decline in animation quality. And when he inquired about these imperfections, he was often given flimsy excuses. It costs too much, it's not worth it. But when he was slowly building up the ranks, he actually realized that it was inoffensive with these minor modifications. Bluth was working for a rigorous company that people didn't question. And well, for a lack of better words, didn't bother to self-improve. Despite being at the top of his league, being essentially a director and producer, just as gradually, Don Bluth would depart from the company, from working on an independent animated short in his own spare time, until eventually by the end of the decade in 1979, on his birthday nonetheless, him and 17 other Disney animators parted ways with the company, as they were literally laughed out of the studio, being told that they would find it near to impossible to make a feature film. Sit back and relax. This is a Scribbles to Screen production. Don't forget to follow Scribbles to Screen on Instagram, Facebook, and specially subscribe on YouTube. Be sure to spread the word to get some missing media found. We'll go and see the cracks again someday. Three years later, Don Bluth would direct his first animated feature, a book adaptation of The Secret of Nim, which Disney passed on the project some years earlier. Although this wasn't an easy project, the money was tight and it returned very little. And I don't know how to make it happen, but you know, I would love to do the sequel to Nim. Someone went out there and did one, but it wasn't right. There were a number of different projects him and his team had longed to work on tempting titles such as The Little Blue Whale, The East of the Sun and West of the Moon, and Beauty and the Beast. But due to financial difficulty, some just never got off the ground or were just cancelled. Thankfully though, one of the few people that saw The Secret of Nim was Steven Spielberg. Where through him, bringing on board Universal and his own company Amblin, Bluth and Spielberg would collaborate on an American tale. Uniting with Spielberg would see the whole Californian crew move over to Dublin Island, which Bluth had already set up an animation department in the country back in 79. This was by a negotiation with the Irish government, or to put it more simply, by helping to set up an animation program in the country. By a trade-off, the studio would see government funding. There were extensive projects and plans to help the Irish film industry, but they never fell through in the end. Because you've got a, you've got a government who recognises art as being necessary. Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Well, come to my neighborhood, Arson. Arson is nowhere here. With the American tale outranking Disney's The Great Mouse Detective, financially, Bluth, who was laughed at several years earlier, had actually surpassed Disney. And now being fully established in Dublin Island, the next film project would only come two years later. And, debatedly, it may be his most famous film ever. <laughs> yeah, we did American Tale, and after American Tale, we had moved the entire studio over to Dublin, Ireland, because we had to to be able to um, make Land Before Time. So we moved to Ireland. Spielberg and Bluth had wanted to create a coming-of-age story in a similar vein to Bambi. Seeing that nobody else had done so before, 
they decided to make the main characters dinosaurs. But what would be the appropriate story for this prehistoric Bambi? George Lucas came on board and suggested some ideas. The first draft of the script was rejected for being too juvenile. An idea of child dinosaurs trying to find an old wise dinosaur was originally the plot. But then an idea spawned of what if all these different species of dinosaurs didn't get along? They clinged on to the concept of real life racism from the words of Bluth at the time. As the storyboarding continued, we came up with another idea that none of these dinosaurs get along with each other. They were taught from the time that they were born to not associate with each other. They're going to have to learn the unracist idea and learn to like each other. And following from another interview, children nowadays watch television and are well aware of the problems that we have. So, tell them a story that will help them solve the problems of the world they live in and then the story becomes relevant. I would rather take the format for a fairy tale and tell a story that you have never heard before but still is in the format of a fairy tale. And so I guess that's basically the difference between Walt Disney Studio and Sullivan Blue Studios is we're trying to do stories that you may not have seen before. Production was a little bit of a bumpy start. They originally wanted the film for 1987, but because they were working on An American Tale and moving to Ireland, they delayed the release for 1988. A huge relief for Don Bluth as he wouldn't need to rush the production within a year. The script still needed to be fully finished, so to keep the animators occupied, they animated the opening sequence. They made it inconsequential to the narrative of the story by telling the origin of life on the planet. Unlike the last Don Bluth production of An American Tale, Spielberg was hardly involved, as he was busy prepping for the third Indiana Jones movie, The Last Crusade. So Don and his directing partner, Gary Goldman, who had co-directed all of Don Bluth's movies, the both of them would have to work independently from Spielberg. And truth be told, according to a crew member, Don Bluth and Spielberg had two different visions for the movie. So eventually, in the schedule when Spielberg had more time to be involved, there would be several fully finished animated scenes that he would demand to be cut. Upon screening six months before release, and then most drastically only several weeks before the film's premiere, he extensively cut an additional 13 to 11 minutes, much to the disapproval of Don Bluth. This was unusual for an animated film as you would usually cut scenes during the storyboard phase not when the animation is fully finished, let alone doing the cuts before release. Were Spielberg and George right to do it in hindsight? I think yes. Lang grossed $72 million worldwide and became one of the supporting pillars for the animation renaissance. Least that you choose to forget, Land Before Time has been followed up by six sequels. Direct a video that have grown in excess of $250 million. That you can't forget. The Land Before Time was released on the same day as Disney's Oliver and Company. I'm actually very excited by the fact that we're going to go head on with the picture because I think there's plenty of room out there in the market for animation. The Land Before Time outgrows Oliver and Company worldwide. The Land Before Time would be the second to last Don Bluth movie released in cinemas that would be globally successful. With the exception of Anastasia, the rest of his movies, to put it nicely, seemed to fare better on the home media format. But his portfolio was successful in other regions. Many have said that the work of Don Bluth and Gary Goldman may have been the push that Disney needed to be launched into the Disney Renaissance. In the 15 years of, of our independent times, the Nim and American Tale, Land Before Time, All Dogs Go to Heaven were all movies that moved people and it moved Disney to do better. So, all wells that ends well. Not exactly. As of 2020, The Land Before Time has spawned over 13 sequels and a TV series. And after nearly four decades later, many fans have pondered as to what was the original cut like? What was Don Bluth and Gary Goldsman's original vision for the film? In the original advertisement for the first film, it featured several shots that weren't in the final version. Now we'll always be together. A Land Before Time dinosaur is only 99 cents, so come to Pizza Hut. Your friends are waiting. We'll always be together. Pizza Hut! 
books, products, featuring images from these cutscenes, with additional images of animation cells reappearing online, and most excitingly, a 1987 draft version of The Land Before Time that has been floating around online for some time now, giving us a luxury to look into an early version of the movie. Granted, there are some minor modifications, such as Littlefoot being called Thunderfoot, and it's widely accepted that not everything in the script was going to be in the final draft script, and Grandpa Longneck in the credits was credited to be played by Bill Irwin, although he never speaks in the final movie, and there's nothing in any other material indicating that he would have spoken. Chances are, there may have been more scenes that have been cut out that are not publicly known, but I shall cover every confirmed deleted scene. So, sit back and relax, as we'll be covering from beginning to end the original version of the land before time. First, let's go over some deleted scenes that were likely not animated. At the beginning of the film, when we're with Littlefoot merely as an infant, there was a sequence where he would have been chased down by a snake, only for his mother to come along and ward off the snake. This was slightly cut due to pacing and was overall rather inoffensive to the main story. But a missing scene that's gone down in legend in the Landfall Time community is the Oasis scene, perhaps the most blatant sequence dealing with the concept of racism. This is where, midway through the story, the group of kids are lost and hungry in the mysterious beyond. But fortunately enough, they come across an oasis. Unfortunately though, it's been occupied by two different dinosaurs. Green food and water! What about the crown heads and the grey noses? Oh, who cares? Let's just eat. Come on! Oh, hey! Back off the green food, kids! This is our area! Only your own kind can eat! Come on, Sarah. Let's just go for the water. Ah, only the little grey nose. The rest of you, back off! Come and join us, darling. There's plenty of water for all of us. But they need drinks, too. They're my friends! Your friends? Freehorn? A long neck, a spike tail, and whatever that is, run away before spikes and horns grow on you. Can't we eat and drink? Why don't you share the food and water with each other? No, 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 no we, we can't, can't, we can't do, do that. that. Grey noses and crown heads are different from each other. Let's leave and find our own food and water. Little thought, what's going to happen if they don't share? I wouldn't like to think. It's most certain that this scene never was animated, but it did make it into the storybook of the film. Okay, putting aside these unmade scenes, let's discuss the actual scenes that were cut out. Starting with the sharp tooth that was mainly removed out, due to Spielberg and Lucas being concerned on how traumatizing the T-Rex could be. You are right there, mate? I hope you have been enjoying the video so far, and if you're a new viewer, then I do hope you do consider to subscribe to the channel and join me along the journey of covering more Lost Media projects. In the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be creating another Lost Media Dinosaur video covering the two movies, One Million Years BC and When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth. As you can tell, I spare no expense of these kind of videos. Right, enough of my gossip. Let's get back to our main programme. The scene would have proceeded forwards, with Littlefoot and Sarah climbing up the hollow tree, although once seeing that the sharp tooth is merely waiting for them, they make a hasty retreat down. The final cut slightly reorganises this chase sequence, pretty much swapping around the first half of the chase. Early in the chase, you can just see where the sharp tooth was blinded in the eye, even though he was yet to be blinded just yet, before finally coming back to the first shot in the final cut. What follows is a number of cut scenes, where Littlefoot and Sarah are constantly cornered by the sharp tooth. Interestingly enough, when the sharp tooth is bursting through the thorns, that shot was split up into two bits, as a handy shot to bridge up the cut sequences. Following onwards, it's been long speculated that the original fight between the sharp tooth and Littlefoot's mum was much more grisly. While there's not much backing for this conceptual idea, there was an intense close-up of Littlefoot's mum being savagely bitten by the sharp tooth. 
Other likely deleted shots from this sequence was Littlefoot and Sarah slamming into the Sharptooth's foot. This is one of the few deleted shots that were featured in the trailer, and there's an animation cell of the Sharptooth likely coming from the earthquake sequence. The death of Littlefoot's mum was nearly considered to be removed in the final cut, as there were concerns from both Spielberg and Lucas that it may have been too traumatic for younger viewers to handle, but the scene was so important to the story, as it essentially explained as to why Littlefoot had to travel alone. The producers brought on some psychologists to give some two cents to the emotional aspect, Penultimately, it was decided to let the scene remain, but to add an elderly dinosaur named Ruta to encounter Littlefoot sometime later after the passing of his mum to enlighten the child of some reassuring advice. You'll never be apart, for you are still a part of each other. Do you remember the way to the Great Valley? Follow the bright circle past the great rock that looks like a long neck, past the mountains the bird. Hello! I said hello! I lost my family in the big earth shake. You want to go with me? Yes! Oh, okay. Who are you? Well, my name's Petrie. <laughs> so, it's you! What happened? I met the sharp tooth! You are a spike tail, so we will call you Spike. Spike was meant to have a much more lengthier introduction, with Ducky and the gang trying to figure out on how to get Spike moving, which being lured by berries seemed to be the trick. I can hear your tummy talking. <laughs> you must still be hungry. Here, here, try this. Ducky, who's this? This is my new friend Spike. Can we take him with us? Huh? Huh? Sure. No, he will slow us down. All that Spike Tails can do is eat and burp. The Sharp Tooth will catch up and eat us. Seriously, Sarah, stop making up stories about the Sharp Tooth. It was speculated that Sarah had wandered off temporarily from the group after they find Spike, as she doesn't appear in any of the scenes, not until the group falsely believes that they found the Great Valley. Although in the original script, there's nothing to indicate that she did wander off, so it may be more of a continuity error rather than a mistake in editing. Bits and pieces of the green food scene were removed in the final version. There was nothing of great significance of the plot in this sequence, but one can certainly notice where the edits were made, such as Sarah, smugly believing that she was able to get the green food down, begins charging into the tree once again, only to be found in the next shot, walking the opposite direction, teasing the group. Animation cells of a cut shot have been rediscovered, with Littlefoot giving a subtle wink to his friends. As a way to protect Sarah's moment, another one of the exerted shots reappeared in the film's advertising. <laughs> Just like my mother said, we're going the right way! The way to the Great Valley! This scene is the only time in the whole movie that we have a freeze frame, an obvious indication that something was hastily edited. Very good find. I, I'm glad that you're picking on the positive points. <laughs> According to the original script, what would have followed would have been a travelling montage. Speculation of the track If We Hold On Together may have been played during the montage, as both the track and the montage would have lined up in the movie soundtrack. Notable shots within this array's portion would have seen Petrie struggle to keep up with the group, clinging to Littlefoot's tail. Sarah would have acted that she had control over the group, hence why her and Littlefoot are at a boiling point during the last third of the movie. Is 
dear. Go on! Go the wrong way! Try to do what you told me. It's just too hard. Mother! Mother! Don't go, Mother! The Great Valley. The others, they went the wrong way. They'll never find the Great Valley. Mother, what should I do? My heart, my heart says, they're my friends. I have to help them. Now we come to the most dramatic reshaping of the film. While Littlefoot is separated, he comes across the Great Valley. Now knowing that his friends have gone the wrong way, he makes a hasty return back. And while he's successful into leading them into the right direction, unfortunately, the danger's not over just yet. The Sharp Tooth is heading for the Great Valley. Thus, they concoct an action plan to lure the creature into a trap to finally take him down. Moving past the dialogue, the action sequence with the sharp tooth is pretty in sync with the final cut. Although barding this small bit where Petrie is holding on for dear life, Ducky attempts to distract the sharp tooth by pulling faces. Being another prime deleted shot exclusively shown in the advertisement. <laughs> This was likely a scene that was cut early on, as the final soundtrack doesn't leave any room to complement these missing scenes. The sharp tooth death would have ended with Petrie being dragged down, with the rest of the characters believing that, well, he died in the moment. But hey, being a kid character and part of the main cast, of course he comes out alright, as the group returns back to Petrie's aid, and with the danger dissipated, they embrace one another. Now we will always be together. For how long? Forever! Together! Together, they arrive back to the Great Valley, and are reunited with their family. The film ends with Sarah speaking highly of her new friend, Littlefoot found his grandmother and grandfather at last. The same loving faces he looked into on the day of his birth. He is my best friend! Erla Mech? No. Littlefoot, we did it together! Together? Together, Daddy! Littlefoot finding the Great Valley was moved near to the end of the film, was likely done to give a much more emotional bearing for the audience. It was really as simple as that. Uh, we reasoned with him. <laughs> if you look in the background, you can see that Littlefoot is within the same location that the Sharp Tooth was defeated. You can even see the boulder in places to where it would be later pushed off. While I've only had the luxury of watching the final cut, for myself, judging the scenes in conception, I personally think that the edits for the ending was a pretty smart move. Getting to the Great Valley was the biggest goal of the movie, so just keeping the audience anticipating by the end, it just helps to make the ending feel far more rewarding. Alongside swapping around the scenes, came with omitting any references of the characters knowing how close they are to the Great Valley. It's sharp too. He's looking through the entrance to the Great Valley. We have to kill him. The shot with the characters embracing one another was moved and reworked to be the final shot of the movie. Have I bored you for too long? Stay awake. In 2017, Gary Goldman, the original composer, gave a bit of insight towards the fate of the original cuts. The tiny short cuts were taped together and we rolled them back to Dublin. However, we never saved the prints or negatives for those scenes. All were animated and cleaned up, many of which were in colour. So, taking this quote to heart, best case scenario, since the original version no longer exists as a negative, it could be a difficult process to restore the prints to a decent state. Or the worst case, the original version is long gone. 
But I would still be personally optimistic that somewhere out there, regardless as to what shape it's in, the original print of the movie is still out there. Keep in mind, there still would have had to have been a clean version without music for its advertisement. and the trailer still features that one shot with Ducky reported to be removed six months before release, even though the majority of the cuts were made very shortly before the film's release. So there was still some preservation of archiving, regardless that these scenes were still not going to be shown. And even post the original movie's release, there are substitute material where they would have needed access from the original voices being separated by the final soundtrack in order to swap out the music. So there has to be some version that still exists within a post-production state so that they can easily go back to and re-edit if they so desired. And the company at hand for making The Land Before Time was Universal, famously during the 80s. They were trying to search for a pre-release cut of Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, so at this point it would have seemed like they would have known too better. Will the public ever get to see it? Well, that's up for either Universal or Spielberg to give the green light on. That's probably only going to happen if there is such a demand to see the original Bluff cut. So for now, the best thing we can do is to show our support. If you personally want to see this original version, make a post or a video explaining why. Learning from prior lost media attempts, sometimes a company's got to be reassured that there's enough interest to lay down the money to fully restore these films and to gain back a profit. Well, most of the time. Come on, we've got seven years before the 40th anniversary of The Land Before Time. Let's push this one through.